Well, welcome if you're visiting with us today. Thanks for coming and joining us and uh, witnessing these baptisms. Uh, we'd l- we're glad that you're here to share this wonderful day with this, these two families. Uh, if you're watching us online, uh, thanks for joining us. I know if you missed the service, you probably check us out online. So thank you for doing that this week. A couple of years ago, I had a very odd experience. I was in that space between wakefulness and dreams. You know what, you know what I mean, right? You're, you're not quite awake, but you're not dreaming either. And it's kind of confusing because you're not sure if you're still dreaming or if what's going on around you is real. You ever had that experience? I woke up. No. Who said no? George. I knew it was George. <laughs> I had that experience, George. It was a strange experience because as I'm in this transition, I'm hearing what I thought was babies crying. And I thought, why are my kids crying? And they kept crying and crying. And I thought to myself, I got to wake up and deal with this. And as I'm waking up, I realize my kids are older. They're not babies anymore. And then the puzzlement sets in, right? You're thinking, what in the world is going on? I get out of bed, go over to the window, and there are these two cats fighting on the fence. And it sounded like babies crying. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it is just an unnerving experience. Now, they wouldn't quit. I mean, it just kept going on and on and on. And so finally, I did the manly thing. I went to the window, threw open the window, and yelled at them. And you know cats, they just kind of went like this and went back to what they were doing. And they kept going. And so I yelled at them again and they completely ignored me. I went downstairs. I went to the sliding door, threw the sliding door open and yelled again, making myself loud and boisterous. And they completely ignored me like cats do. And they're still screaming and fighting. And now it's the hissing and the clawing that's going on on the fence. And so I figure, I, I've got to get these cats separated. So I see the recycling box, which is close by. I pick up a milk jug, and I pitch it at the fence and hit the fence. And guess what the cats did? Completely ignored me. <laughs> they just kept going on at it. And so I figured the only thing I can do is i got to get close to them. i got to get close enough for them to get uh, afraid of me. So I run over to where the cats are on the fence. And wouldn't you know it, both of them look at me and they jump into my backyard and are now running around after each other in the backyard. So me, thinking, not thinking clearly, start chasing these cats around my yard. And I'm yelling at them and I'm trying to throw things at them. And then I have this moment of clarity. It's three o'clock in the morning, Martin. You're in your underwear. You're running around your yard, and you have no idea where the clothesline is. And you can stop in those moments of clarity, and you can pay attention to them, or you can keep running, like I did. There are these times when you get those moments of clarity, right? You have these in the midst of the busyness and the craziness, and all of a sudden, something happens, a moment, a kairos moment. And you get this moment of clarity. When I was in grade three back in Hamilton, uh, we had this amazing piece of technology. Now, those of you who are under 30, you're going to be completely amazed by this old piece of technology. For those of you who are my age, you remember this. You're going to be nodding and thinking, oh, yeah, I remember those. In the classroom, we had this incredible piece of technology where you could listen to a record player with headphones on. I know. What was really amazing was is that they had this central hub and a big table, and you could plug in your headphones, eight of us at a time. See, some of you are nodding. You're like, yeah, I was there. I remember those days. And then eight students could listen to the, the, to the record while everybody else was doing other things. It was so much fun. I enjoyed it a lot, except for when a friend of mine sitting next to me decided to turn up his volume, except it wasn't his, it was mine. And he kept turning it up and turning it up and turning it up. And I remember it being so loud in my head that I'm screaming at the top of my lungs over the sound in my head at him who's sitting right next to me. And I remember throwing the headphones off onto the table, screaming at him to stop and realize that everyone is looking right at me. There are times in your life when the busyness, the noise is so loud that you can't hear. You can't hear because of the busyness and the noise. 
And you almost have to yell over top of the noise in order to be heard by the people around you. I think that that is true in our relationship with God when it comes to hearing him. It's an opportunity that we have sometimes when we get those moments of clarity, when we have the wherewithal to throw off the headphones and pay attention for a few moments that God might actually break in and speak to us. There are noises that drown out the voice of God. There's busyness that keep us from slowing down long enough to hear the voice of God. And if you're like me, you've got your share of problems. And if you've got a share of problems in your life, you're probably wondering about how to fix them. And I do too, and I try to fix them on my own strength oftentimes. And really what's often the issue is that I'm not able to hear when God wants to give me wisdom. I'm not able to hear when he wants to shower me with his love. I'm not able to hear when he wants to show his peace and his comfort to me because either I'm not paying attention or life is just too crazy. And for some of you, you you desperately want that experience and you've never had that before. Or maybe you've had the experience and maybe if I describe it to you like those moments of clarity, like those moments when you think, I think my my conscience is trying to get my attention. Maybe when you think there's, a, there's too many coincidences happening right now, that this isn't a coincidence, that it might actually be a God incidence. And for many of you, you may not even know how to recognize when God is speaking to you. What we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is we're starting a series called Kairos. And if you've been around here long enough, you heard me use that word a lot. Basically, it means a moment in time. It's a Greek word that describes a moment in time. The word that we're more familiar with is chronos, uh, sequential time, like you have on your watch, right? That's chronos time. A moment in time, a kairos moment, is often associated as in the Christian walk and the Christian life when God is trying to get your attention. He's tapping on the door of your soul. He's pricking your conscience. He's trying to speak words of life, hope, joy, peace in the midst of whatever you're going through. But so often, we're not listening. God wants to break through the circumstances of our life. Today, what I'd like to talk about is how God speaks primarily through the word of God. We're going to be talking about how God uses the circumstances of our life through promptings that a nudge in your spirit that sometimes God uses pain in order to get our attention. And then I'd like to spend another Sunday talking about how our own desires internally are how God speaks to us and how he uses the people in our life often to confirm them or to redirect us or to give us further wisdom and insight. Maybe the rhythm of your life is off right now and you need a little bit of insight from God. But the voices in your head are keeping you distracted. You know that voice? That voice that says that you're not good enough? Who do you think you are? Why do you think that you could do that? You know that voice that maybe sounds like your dad or your mom? That sounds maybe like your own? That you've been telling yourself long and long enough? I'm asking you to pause today. To let the voice of God speak Are you ready to do that with me? Prepare your heart for what God might say. Let me share with you something from the book of Samuel. In my devotional reading over the last uh, couple of months, I came past this passage in the book of Samuel, Samuel chapter 3. Samuel is a young boy at this stage. He's going to be an amazing and important prophet. Two books of the Bible are written by him, and he has some incredible stories of God's faithfulness. But there's a problem that's happened. Uh, Samuel's mom uh, couldn't have children. And this miraculous birth of this boy, Samuel, comes when she goes to the temple to pray, to ask God to be in the midst of this. And God grants her prayer, and she says, Lord, if you grant me children, I will give my eldest to the service of the temple. 
And she visits him regularly, but after he's weaned, she brings him and leaves him at the temple. Could you imagine doing that to your oldest son? But she's so grateful because God has given her a child. And Samuel grows up in the home of Eli, the priest, and his other sons. And the Bible talks about how poorly Eli is raising his children. These boys are stealing from the people who are bringing their gifts into the temple. They're giving themselves the best portions. And consequently, what happens, the Bible says, is that the voice of God diminished and gets quieter and quieter. And I don't know if you've had that experience in your life, but when you're far from God, when you haven't spoken to him in a while, when your devotional time has slipped and gone silent, as the story of David, he shared, Dave shared with us earlier, the busyness of life comes in and you can't hear the voice of God. This is from Samuel chapter three, verse one. Meanwhile, while all this other stuff is going on, while Eli and his sons are not doing well, as the voice of God continues to diminish, meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon, Well, probably because of Eli's lack of faithfulness and the son's bad behavior. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, And Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Tabernacle is another word for temple. It was the temporary shelter before they built one. But at this point, there's an interesting little side note here. There must have been some building going on because Eli's living there and Samuel is now sleeping in the temple next to the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied. What is it? And he got up and he ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. And so he did. And then the Lord called out again, Samuel. And again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. I just want to pause here for a second. See, I think that many of us can identify with that statement. That some of you have been grown up in the church and been coming regularly, especially if you're younger. That you've seen the faith of these other people. You've seen faith in maybe your parents, but you haven't had that experience. That powerful presence of God. What David talked about, the call of God on his heart. I want to tell this to you. I want to share this to you. Because what happens next is extremely profound. God does not give up. So the Lord called a third time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? And then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. And so he said to Samuel, go lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and then the Lord came and called as before. Samuel, Samuel. I just want to pause for a moment here, too. I want to know if you'd be willing to pray with me a very profound prayer. It's an ancient prayer. It's a prayer that Samuel spoke next. But I want to caution you. If you want to say these six words with me in a prayer, by saying, God, I want to hear you. I want to listen to you. I want you to speak to me. Then what you must also be willing to do is to listen, even though you may not like what God is saying. You see, we want to be comforted by God, but often accompanies conviction. We want, uh, often what we need, what we hear is, um, let me say this again, it's often what you want to hear the least that is often what we need to hear the most. So if you're going to say this prayer with me, I want you to be ready to hear what God is saying, but also be ready to listen. 
Here it is. These six words. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Would you pray with me? Lord, I want to ask right now in this space, in this moment, to give each person here an opportunity to say this prayer. It's a profound prayer. It changed my life and continues to change it. We've seen how by saying yes to you, by listening to you, that lives are changed. Lord, I pray right now that each person would be able to, in their own mind, in their heart, say these words with me. Speak. Your servant is listening. Amen. When I was in high school, I never thought I would read a book again. Anybody with me? (laughs) After I finished high school? Uh, I thought for sure I was done reading and that I wouldn't have to read another book again. A couple of years later, I got a job working shifts and with AJ working days and me working nights, there was a lot of times when I was at home alone and so I I picked up a book and started reading and I uh, uh, reignited this love for reading that I have today. I love fiction and science fiction, mysteries, and as my faith began to grow, I loved reading biographies and theology and good uh, teachings from uh, some great Christian writers. And over the years, I've really enjoyed getting to read again. One of my favorite authors, Tim Keller, said this about uh, what you read. When you listen and read one thinker, you become a clone. That makes sense, right? You become like them or you think like them. If you uh, two thinkers, you become confused. (laughs) Well, they said that and then they said that. Ten thinkers, and you start developing your own voice. You're like, oh, okay. I've now got the scope of this, and I'm starting to come up with my own voice. Two or three hundred thinkers, and you become wise. And I think that that's true. Over the course of my life, I've read lots and lots of books. And I heard it said one time that uh, an author puts about two years of experience into a book. So when you read a book, you're getting that person's two years of their life experience, their journey, their faith story, their uh, application of the word of God and uh, stories from other people. And you get to read that and you gain two years of experience in reading one book. Well, I I looked at my bookshelves and I realized that I probably have read about 2,000 books in my life, and that makes me 4,000 in book years. (laughs) I have the gray hair to show it. (laughs) A scientist, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, said this, the best way to wrap up an idea is to put it in a person. The theological word for this is called incarnation. And if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, what we teach here regularly is that the word of God came wrapped in a person. The book, the Bible, is represented in Jesus. He is the personification of who God is. If you want to know God, look at Jesus. If you want to know how to live your life, ask Jesus. If you want to know what to do in response to the life that you're leading, Find out what Jesus would have done. Jesus is the expression of this one book that is different than every other one. That's the Bible. This book stands far above every other one. And it's the primary means that God uses to speak to you. If you want to hear the voice of God, read the scriptures. Because the Bible says that it's alive and it is active. It's not a static book. When you read it, it starts to read me. If you've ever read the Bible and you've paid attention to the words on the page, you've read a good translation, not a bad one, let's, you know, King James or, you know, Shakespeare language, read a readable translation, please. There are lots of good options out there. Put that nice King James Bible that you put on the coffee table in the cupboard and grab a good copy and read it because it begins to read you. It begins to pierce your soul. The Holy Spirit exhaled these words and you get to inhale them when you read the word of God. We never get to the bottom of the Bible It's new and fresh every time I read it. I've read it cover to cover many times, and I come back to it again, marveling at the fact that what I'm going through today, this week or right in front of me, the Bible speaks. 
but it's God speaking to me. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, this about the Bible. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. It teaches us from generation to generation what is true. Every culture, every group of people, every parent who's passed it on to their children needs the word of God so that we understand what truth is. Our world, our society wants to tell you what their version of the truth is or to tell you that what you can believe is different than what they can believe, and there are two truths. The scriptures are the way that we know what God is saying. It helps us realize moment by moment what's wrong. When I read the Bible, there are moments when it speaks to me where it jumps off the page and it pierces my heart. I told you that I was reading from 1 Samuel. And this is from my journal that I wrote By the way, I never journaled before the last couple of years. I would highly recommend that you do that. It gives you an opportunity to write down some thoughts and some ideas. I wrote this about Hannah's prayer, Samuel's mom. She wrote this, this, her prayer is recorded in chapter two of this book. She prays this prayer, God gives her a child, and this is the prayer that she prays in thanks to God. And it's a prayer that seems a bit fatalistic. You know, some people are blessed and other people aren't. Some people have money, some people don't. Sometimes stuff happens to me and sometimes it doesn't. And then at the end, she prays this amazing prayer. She says, he will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear. He gives power to his kings and he strengthens the strength of the anointed one. He lifts the poor from the dust for all the earth is the Lord's and he has set the world in its order. This prayer is hopeful. This prayer spoke to me deeply. This is what I wrote. Hannah's prayer of praise to God. It's a strange prayer, but I guess what I hear her saying is that the Lord is God and that he blesses some more than others, but he is still God. And yet Hannah prayed for a child when she had none. She could have been fatalistic. She could have said, well, that's just my plight in life. But she prayed for a child and God rescued her. And then I wrote this, am I content to allow God to bless me where I am? Hannah prayed for God to show her favor. What are you praying for, Martin? Who are you praying for? And then I listed a bunch of people and I wrote them down and I prayed for them. The Bible continues to amaze me as it speaks again and again about what is true, what is wrong in our life. It speaks to us on the faith journey. It corrects our faulty navigation. When we think we are going one way, it says, no, you need to go back this way. And then it helps us in the future about what God needs to say to us, the wisdom that he can give. The Bible speaks God's words to you and to me. So how do you do that? It's not rocket science. It's not really that difficult. As a matter of fact, if I picked up the Bible and read to you for just a moment, we could walk through very easily and quickly, what is God saying in the text? What might he be saying to you? And then what are you going to do about it? How are you going to live in response to that? You don't need special training in order to do it. If you want to buy a study Bible for some of the more peculiar passages, I'd encourage you to do that. But by and large, the Bible is plain. It wants to highlight how people made dumb mistakes. (laughs) So don't do those things. And it wants to share with us the path of salvation, of God's love and about hope, about wisdom for the future, about what he might be saying to you in all of this. Because for some of us, we don't know how to recognize God's voice. We might not know what it sounds like. And so what I'm asking you to do is begin here. Begin with the word of God because everything else needs to be put up against it and say, is God saying that to that person? Well, let's look at this Bible. What does the Bible say? The Bible cannot, God is not contradicting himself. This is the final word of God. 
This is the standard by which we do all of the listening that we do. And reading is so important on that journey. For those of you who are technology-minded, get your phones out and download an app, a Bible reading app. I love the one called YouVersion, Y-O-U version. It has lots of different translations. It has Bible reading plans. It has devotions. It has all kinds of things to help you get the Word of God into you on a regular basis. Join a small group. Be part of a community where you can talk about the Word of God together. Elisa and I, we offer small groups regularly every week. We're going to be going into a small group series in the spring. We're going to be offering more opportunities. But journeying along with a group of people and asking the question, okay, what does this mean? Or how do I live this? Or what do I do in response to that? That's the community that you can have together, a relationship with one another where you can hear from God. And here's the beauty of it. When you hear from God and you actually put it into practice, your life is transformed. Just think about the passage that I wrote about myself. I changed my behavior because of what God's word said to me. It was a simple thing. Martin, start praying for these people. Don't be satisfied for where they're at. Martin, keep praying for the church. Keep praying for discovery. Keep praying for those people that you've just kind of said, okay, well, they're okay, so I'm not going to pray for them anymore. Pray for God's blessing to come upon them in a powerful way. It changes you. Listen to the word of God. Allow it to change you. But make a plan. And if you need to, have somebody hold you accountable to reading it. Because you and I both know that the busyness of life and the craziness of our schedules and the noise keeps us from doing it on a regular basis. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if each one of you committed to reading one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, pick one. And if we began to read it and something jumped out of the page, God convicted you of something. You thought, you know what? I think God might be asking me to do something. If we committed to reading the Bible and stopping when we heard something from God and then acted it out and didn't read another single thing, because the, uh, the problem that most often happens with us Christians is that we read it, if you are reading it, but we don't respond to it. What would happen if we actually read it until God spoke to us and then followed through and didn't read again until we did what God asked us and then read again? I, I, know, I think I know what might happen. I think that God's kingdom would come here on earth. That his peace and his love and his passion and his salvation would come here on earth in your life. You would see the evidence of the kingdom of God. You would see Jesus in the lives of the people around you. You would see your life changed for the glory of God and give to him your life. You see this prayer that we prayed together, this prayer that you might have prayed with me, is an opportunity for you to step fully into this journey of saying, okay, Lord, if this is how you communicate to me, then I'm going to pick up this book and I'm going to read it. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Lord, I want to thank you for the word of God. I want to thank you that it's so powerful that it cuts through all kinds of things. The ideas I have about myself, Lord, you speak so clearly that I am a child of yours. Thank you, Lord, that the word of God speaks into the day-to-day situations of my life. Thank you, Lord, that you give me wisdom when I need it and you help me to understand what your will is. But Lord, give me the courage and the strength to when I hear you, when we hear you, to do what you're asking us. To step out fully and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening.